Okay. Um, so the stream should be working. Okay. All right. And everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Why can I hear an echo? One second, I hear an echo myself. There it is. Okay, can everybody see uh, the PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay. All right, um, so uh, again, if this is like always, if this is your first time joining, um, this is uh, my introduction. My name is Mark Abdrahmanov. I'm an undergraduate senior at Stony Brook University. I'll be getting my Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry in a couple of days, actually. Um, my MCAT date was January 16th of this year, so pretty recent. I scored a 520, and uh, here's my score breakdown. Um, if you want to contact me, um, is my email, okay? Um, so the course description, so this course will run eight weeks. We're in week five, I believe, of the week eight. Um, lectures every Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, office hours every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we cover different topics, also in between the four sections, and it ends June 6th. Um, after this, we'll launch a 15-week full course, three lectures per week, once two office hours per week, and we'll cover most of the MCAT content, okay? And we're planning to start that week of June 14th. Um, this is the group meet. I will post this in the chat later. Um, this group meet is for just this program. It's for any updates, questions you may have, any um, links or anything we may send out to you guys. And we'll also be posting the links to the recordings and the PowerPoints on there as well after each week. Okay. Um, so today we'll be covering acids and bases. So the learning objectives is first we want to define acids and bases. Um, then we want to find out what the key properties of them are. Uh, we want to see how we can measure acidity and basicity. And we want to learn about titration and how we can measure it and what we can learn from titration curves. Okay. So on to the content. So what are acids and bases? Well, there's three main definitions that um, to acids and bases that the MCAT wants you to know. First is the Arrhenius um, definition, and this is the one you may be most familiar with. It's the simplest one. It focuses on just H plus and OH minus. Um, there's the Bronsted and Lowry definition, which focuses instead on protons and the movement of protons. And there's the Lewis definition, which focuses on electron pairs and the movement of them. Okay. Right. So starting with the simplest one, the Arrhenius definition. So I, like I mentioned, this is the classic definition and it focuses on OH minus and H plus. So acids are molecules that can increase the concentration of H plus in the solution, and bases are molecules that increase the concentration of OH minus in the solution. So for example, HCl dissociates into H plus and Cl minus, and it, so it would increase the concentration of H plus. Therefore, it is an acid. NaOH dissociates into Na plus and OH minus, so therefore it increases the concentration of OH minus in the solution and is therefore a base by the Arrhenius definition. The strength of the acid and the base is dependent on how easily it dissociates from its, uh, into its components. So HCl is very strong acid by this definition because it can dissociate its H plus and Cl minus very easily. It, it's, um, it does it very quickly and does it very easily and does it um, mo almost all of the HCl. Once you put it into a solution, it will dissociate. Okay? Weaker acids um, may not be fully dissociated when they're put into solutions. So some of it will be dissociated into parts but some of it will still remain as like the full acid and it won't contribute to the H plus or OH concentration and therefore it will not be counting towards the acidity, okay? All right. Um, so next we wanna talk about the Bronsted-Lowry definition. This is probably the most tested one and this is kind of like the most important definition that you'll be using, okay? So this definition focuses, like I mentioned, on protons, right? Acids are molecules that donate protons, while bases are, are molecules that accept protons, right? They're proton acceptors. So going back to the Arrhenius definition, um, like we mentioned with acids, they are molecules that increase the concentration of H plus. 
if you look at the periodic table, H plus is just one proton and one electron, right? So H plus is actually just one proton, which is the same thing as uh, Brown supplier definition. Therefore, acids are pretty much the same. The, the major difference is actually the bases. So in the Arrhenius definition, bases are more OH minus focused, whereas here they're more proton acceptors. So what are some examples of this? So uh, an example of bronsted lowry acid is um, this, which is acetic acid, um, which has the formula here and the picture um, here. So because the OH can be deprotonated into COO minus and H plus, so if you have this equation, if you have this um, molecule, the H can just come off and make this a negative charge and this a positive charge. Um, similar to the dissociation we talked about for Arrhenius. And it's a, and this proton can be donated to either a water molecule or to another molecule, okay? And act as an acid. On the other hand, um, this, which is a um, methyl group with a um, amino group, it's a base because the NH2 can be protonated into NH3+, right? So if you notice here, it has a lone electron pair. So what can happen is if you, for example, take the H plus off this, and then you move it onto here, you can actually take the proton and make a bond with the third H, and this will make the N H2 into NH3, and it will add a positive charge onto this. Um, as, as you can see, from based on the Arrhenius definition, this wouldn't really be a base because it, it doesn't work with OH minus directly at least, it doesn't have OH minus in it. But based on this expanded definition, it, it can still be a pretty strong base just because it can accept a proton, okay? Are there any questions on these so far, these two? No. Okay. Um, all right, um, so as I mentioned here, with we have the same exact um, acid and base and same conversion I mentioned, the OH gets deprotonated and the NH2 gets protonated and you get this. So this is a conjugate base and a conjugate acid. So if you notice the acid, once it's deprotonated, it becomes a conjugate base. The base, once it's protonated, becomes the conjugate acid. So you can think of it this way. So the acid gave up its proton. It's a proton donor and it can give up its proton. That's why it's an acid. Once it does that, it can no longer give up its proton anymore. Therefore, it's no longer an acid because it already gave it up. Whereas um, now it actually can accept a proton into the same slot that it gave it up from. As you can see here, the O minus. This is the location of like the basic component. And that's why it's now a conjugate base. Um, an important note is a strong acid has a weak conjugate base and a weak acid has a strong conjugate base. Uh, a weak conjugate, wait, strong acid has a weak conjugate base and a weak acid has a strong conjugate base. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so uh, Opal mentioned, how do we know which H is given up? Okay, so each H and if there are multiple H's on, um, on a molecule, that can be given up, it'll, it'll tell you um, the pKs of each one, which we'll talk about later. Um, and you, that based on that, you'll determine which one gets given up first. Similar to how in amino acids, um, certain ones get given up first, right? The reason you know it's not this alpha H is because hydrogen attached to carbon is basically never acidic. It, it's this, it would have to like be, very, 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 very strong base for it to give it up, and it would basically never happen. So we just, if it if it's attached to a carbon directly, a hydrogen, it won't give up. It won't act as an acid. Usually, it's attached to an oxygen or some other kind of um, very strong um, uh, molecule, like maybe like I mentioned, the chlorine, fluorine, um, bromine, something like that. Okay. Um, sulfur, phosphorus, something like that, okay? It has to be attached to something that's, um, that's electronegative, right? Um, and with uh, bases, it should be something that has a lone pair, right? Like this N, which can attach. Because it needs a space to attach to, okay? Does that make sense? Um, so 
uh, Tim mentioned, but weak acid doesn't necessarily have a strong conjugate base. So the it might not be a strong base by definition. So like NaOH is a strong base. So like it might not be a strong base by definition, but it's a stronger it, it's a stronger base. I should say it that way. It's a stronger base. Not it's not necessarily a strong base. If that makes sense. Okay, and the way you can think about it is, so this acid is, it pretend this acid was a strong acid. It, it's actually not, but if we were to pretend it was, it wants to give up its, its proton or its H very readily. It's very comfortable giving it up, right? And turning into this conjugate base. So it very easily can give up its H and become the conjugate base. Once it becomes the conjugate base, it doesn't really want to take that H back. It doesn't want to accept the H back because it gave it up in the first place. It's not, it's comfortable being in this uh, deprotonated position. That's why it's a strong acid. So it would be a weak base because it wouldn't be very good at accepting protons back because it doesn't want to. Whereas something that is, that doesn't want to give up its protons. So pretend this was a weak base now, a weak acid now. It, did, it doesn't want to give up its proton, but somehow you forced it to give it up. So now it's in this form. It's now a stronger um, conjugate base. And the first chance it gets, it'll want to take its H back because it didn't want to give it up in the first place. So it'll be a stronger base because it wants to take it back because it wasn't originally comfortable giving it up. Okay. Yeah. So halogens would be uh, good. There's other examples like sulfur, phosphorus. Uh, that can make strong acids as well, which we'll cover later. But it needs to be something that's electronegative. It can't be carbon. Um, so, and last definition we want to cover is the Lewis definition. So, the Lewis definition is the least one that is the one that will be least tested directly. So, the concept has a different name that you may know better from organic chemistry called nucleophile and electrophile. So it, and as the name may suggest, it focuses on electrons. Acids and bases are electron acceptors like nucleophiles, while bases are electron donors like electrophiles, okay? And so it's, when you see a question that tests on nucleophiles, electrophiles, it's not really an acid and base question. The idea is the same as acids and bases according to this definition, but it's, but you may not have learned it that way and it's not really, um, tested that way, yeah. So I would really think nucleophiles and electrophiles are a different topic in organic chemistry We're from acids and bases, but just know that the Lewis definition is referring to, um, yeah, HF, as to mention in the chat, sorry, um, HF is not a strong acid. So um, yeah, but it something that with a carbon is not an acid at all, pretty much. Um, so acids are electron acceptors, nucleophiles will base are electron donors, electrophiles. So a Lewis base can be something like NH3, which we mentioned could be uh, according to the um, Bronsted-Lauer definition, also a base. It can be a base, a Lewis base as well. Or it could be something like a benzene ring, which you may not think usually as a base, but according to this definition, it's an electrophile because it can um, take substitutions, like it can take electron donations. And so it can be a base, not a very strong one, but it can be one nonetheless, according to Lewis. Um, a Lewis acid can be some things that we really never think of as acids, like a metal cation, like Fe3+, or maybe even something like this um, ethylene that you see here, um, which has a positive charge, right? And this wants to give up its positive charge, and so it'll uh, accept an electron, right? Any questions on Lewis acids or anything that I've covered so far on the three definitions so far? Do they ask this as discrete questions or passage since the all three definitions and Tim stated that he was tested on it explicitly? How is this asked? I, I can't give you an exact answer because I don't know which test you'll be taking. They may ask you explicitly. They may ask you indirectly through a passage. Um, they may ask you like, for example, which of these is not a Lewis acid, right? So some, they might ask you which, which of these is not a Lewis acid and they'll have an option where it's like HCl, this metal cation Fe3+, 
this ethylene with like a positive charge on it or and then some other thing that's not a Lewis acid. I'll ask you which of these is not a Lewis acid and you would have to pick the correct answer. Something like that. So you have to kind of, you kind of have to know like what is and isn't an acid and base according to each definition because what is an acid and base is different according to each definition. Okay. Um, and yes, uh, all of these slides and the recordings of this lecture will be uh, available. The recording on YouTube, the lecture slides will be posted in a Google Drive as a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, how can we measure acidity? So there are two measures. Uh, measurements involved with acids and bases. They're very different from each other, so I don't want you to group them together, but I just wanna know there are two different measurements, okay? So the common one is pH, and I'm sure you've heard this before. It's the acidity or basicity of a solution, specifically of a solution. So pH seven means the solution is perfectly balanced, so it's not acidic or basic, it's neutral. Um, less than seven means it's acidic, so uh, pH of one to seven means it's uh, one to, six, I guess, or 6.5 means it's acidic. Higher than seven, so it's from seven and the cap is 14, means it's basic. So a pH four of a liquid solution would mean that dissolved in the liquid is more acid than base. And so the solution as a whole is slightly acidic. There may be some base in the solution, but there's much more acid, okay? And pH is simply just, um, and we'll get to this later, simply a measure of the concentration of H, of H plus in the solution. Um, when we get to, um, well, we'll talk about this later, but there's also pOH, which much less common, you don't really see it. Um, and it's the measure of OH minus, and it's like the measure of acidity, right? And it's just like the, the, the inverse, the flip of pH. So the other measurement is pKa. And this is completely different from pH in the sense that this refers to the acidic strength of a compound rather than a solution. So of a specific molecule, like for example, um, this molecule of um, acetic acid or of this um, methyl with a nitrogen group, or maybe even this deprotonate version or whatever. But pKa is specifically the measure of acidic strength of a compound or of a molecule. The lower the pKa, the stronger the compound is as an acid. So for example, the pKa of HCl is about negative six. Really, when it comes to like strong acids like HCl, negative six is kind of like, it's not actually something that you can measure. It's more theoretical. People have just kind of given it that value like based on theoretical mathematical um, research. It's not actually like you can't test it because you can't technically have a, like a pKa that you can measure below zero but uh, we give negative values to really strong acids, okay? Um, the pKa of acetic acid, which is a weak acid, relatively weak acid, is about four to five. So it's definitely weaker than HCl and it's generalized as a weak acid. Um, H3 plus NH3 plus, which is the conjugate acid version of the NH2, which I mentioned, it's about 11. So it's a much weaker acid than even a weak acid like acetic acid, but it is still somewhat acidic, okay? Yeah. Um, general pKa values, yeah. So weak acid is in the range of like four to six-ish. Very weak acids like conjugate is about 11, uh, 10 to 15 maybe you would think. And um, strong acids are in the negatives or like one or zero or negative, okay? I don't think they can be uh, zero actually. So it's either close to zero, one, negative, whatever. Okay. So what does this actually mean? So pKa really refers to the pH at which the concentration of the acid is equal to the concentration of the conjugate base of that compound. So um, for example, if we wanna look at again, um, the, this um, acid, acetic acid and its conjugate base, pKa is the value in which half of the acetic acid is in this form, the acid form, and exactly half of it is in this conjugate base form. At that pH, which I mentioned, since it's pKa four or five, 
at about pH four or five, half of it will be in this form, half of it will be exactly in this form, right? Okay, or in equal amounts, I should say, but yeah, half. Okay, and that's when the pH and the pK are equal to each other. So a great equation that I recommend that you know is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Um, so why doesn't F want to give up H? It's just because it's, um, yeah, yeah. So as to mention, it's super small. It's, yeah, uh, fluorine is very um, specific in that case. No, no, it doesn't apply to CL. C CL is, um, first, it's H much less electronegative than fluorine. And it's also uh, a little bit bigger. So it, it wouldn't apply to CL. So uh, out of the halogens, um, HF is, I think, the only weak acid. The, I know HBr and HCl are very strong. Yes, so um, as I mentioned this earlier, and actually I will have a question on this um, today, uh, you do have to know the pKs of the different terminals, C terminus, N terminus, and of all the different amino acid uh, residues. And if you wanna go back to lecture one, I have them all in a table for you. In, in lecture one, because I covered this before. Okay. Okay. Um, so like I, meant, I was talking about the, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So this is an equation that you really um, should kind of know. And it says pH equals pK plus log concentration of the conjugate base over the weak acid for weak acid. Or um, this one you don't really uh, have to use. pOH equals pKB plus log concentration of acid over base. It's just um, the logs are flipped and it's pKB instead of pK and pOH instead of pH. Okay. Um, but th this is the one you really... Um, no, the pH equals pK plus log concentration of conjugate base of weak acid. And like I mentioned here, when the amount of con conjugate base and con uh, weak acid is equal, this means same so a number over itself is one because they're equal. Log of one is always zero. Um, so pH equals pK plus zero, pH equals pK. Okay. And that's how you mathematically can reason that out. This is an important equation. Um, so this is an important equation just for, they might ask you questions directly regarding it. Find the pH of, at a certain concentration, find the concentration of a certain pH and knowing the pKa, something like that. They may ask you for one of the variables in this equation. So you should know it, okay? Um, any questions? About yes, I so have more? a question. So what it says conjugate based on weak acid, that is referring to your concentrations, right? Yes, yeah, so um, th this is for, uh, future reference, whenever you see this hard bracket and something inside these hard brackets, it means concentration. The hard brackets are a symbol of concentration. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yes, so um, uh, I'll get to that later actually, yeah. So the pH plus pOH is actually always equal to 14, but I'll actually get, I'll get to that later. I'll show you that formula. Um, yeah, it depends on what they give you, but th that equation is right. pH minus 14 equals pOH. Um, I mean, no, no, no. It would be uh, 14 minus uh, pH equals pOH. Sorry, that's just reverse. pH plus pOH equals 14. Yeah. Yeah, but I will, I will show that on screen later, okay, for everybody. All right. Any questions about this? Is that really comfortable actually doing logs? Because you don't have a cal calculator, so you will have to do logs um, in your head on the test. Is everybody comfortable? Or do you want me to do a quick detour to talk about logs? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so log of something, let me see if, um, if now is the best time or maybe if I can do it. Actually, now would be a good time. So log essentially means, um, I think I can do this better with annotations. Um, so, I, so Tim memorized some. Um, when he did it, I did not. So we can do this. So like say log, okay, you guys can see the annotation. Log, when it just says log like this, it essentially it means log to the base 10. So log has different bases, but if it's not written, it's a base 10 and that's the only one they'll ask you because it's the easiest one to do in your head. The only one you really can do in your head and of X, okay. And then equals Y. So number, 
Um, potentially this means 10 to what power is uh, y? So let's say, um, so let's say we're doing uh, the conversion of k to pk, which I'll also get to later, but it, it involves logs, right? right? So k will be, let's say, 10 to the negative sixth. And you want, and they ask you to find the pk. Well, the equation is log of so pk is log k, right? And it's actually negative log, but um, we're, we're going to pretend it's, not, it's positive for now. Um, just to make it less confusing. So if it's 10 to the negative sixth, what to the net log means what to 10 to the what power would be whatever this is inside, right? So this is 10 to the negative six, it's very simple. 10 to the what power is equal to 10 to the negative six? Well, it's six, right? So, so it'd be six. Let me see if I can actually clear some of this. Okay. Um, so going back to this, 10 to um, what power is equal to x? And you can find that out based on just the x point, right? So if x is equal to 10 to the eighth, then y is just eight. And that means here, if you ask y is just eight, okay? And if, if you're given an x, okay? Um, yeah. Okay, yes. Um what if x was not given in the form of 10 to the power, let's say any number? So it, in here, it would always be given 10 to the power, what uh, to the power of something, because that, that's how it's always given. Okay. Um, if, well, the, and that's also how you do scientific notation with the 10. Um, so what it could be given is something like this, five times 10 to the negative fifth, or let's say to the positive fifth, it's that's easier. And they'll say, um, what's log of this? You actually don't know what log of this is and you can't figure and you can't figure out exactly, but you can guess. And they're okay with that because they'll give you the opportunity to guess. You know that one, if this was one times 10 to the fifth, that means the log of this would equal five because it would be the, the exponent, right? But it's five times 10 to the, to the fifth. You don't know exactly what that is because you don't have a calculator but you know it's five points something, something, let's say four-ish, five point like four-ish. But you don't know exactly what, and when they give you the answer choices, the answer choices will be like one, 5.5, 10, or like 30. And it'll, it'll be very clear that they like, what it'll be, it won't give you like anything that's way too close. So you, you can recognize that one times 10 to the fifth is five, five times 10 to the fifth is a little bit bigger, but it's not six, it's, it's less than six because in order to be six, it would have to be to the power of six, which this is less than one times 10 to the sixth power. So it would be like 5.4, 5.5, something like that, maybe, okay? Yeah, thank you. And um, and like I said, in the answer choices, they'll make it clear. They'll make they'll give you a big difference in the um, answer choices so that you'll know because you they don't expect you to do calculator. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm echoing off some of these. Okay, um, so memorizing logs, I never did it because I always did it this way, um, but you can if you want to. I never came across a problem where they asked like log two, log three, log four. Maybe Tim has it, maybe it would help to memorize them. I always kind of did it like th this way, kind of like guessing, estimating, and th they're, they're mostly okay with this, right? 
But if you want to memorize it, just make it quicker so you don't have to like kind of think about it very much, then you can also do that. It, it can help with time. Okay. Does that answer everybody's question about log? Actually, and um, yeah, and I did want to mention um, in case you didn't know, in case you didn't know, like I mentioned, log, just writing log is log base 10. LN is actually just log base E, like the constant E. And so you, it's just E to the power of what equals X. So ln x is just log base e is just, the answer is just whatever this is, but they won't do that because that's what you need to calculate for that because e is way too hard to calculate. Okay. Let me continue. Okay. So how do we uh, use this henderson hasselbalch equation, this knowledge, right? We know that for any molecule, if it is a stronger acid than the other molecules around it, it'll act as an acid and it'll donate a proton and it itself will become deprotonated because it donates a proton. We also know that pH is a measure of the acidity of the solution or the amount of acid relative to base in a way. If you drop a molecule into a solution of known pH, you can tell whether or not it will act as an acid, okay? So the general rule is that the environment is more acidic than a molecule uh, uh, then a molecule, the molecule will not act as an acid and it will remain protonated. If it is more acidic than the environment, it will act as an acid and deprotonate. So if the pH of a solution is greater than the pKa, then the molecule is deprotonated. So what that means is if the pH is greater than the pKa, um, the molecule is more acidic than the environment. And so it will give up its proton. If instead the pH is lower than the pKa, it means the environment is more acidic than the molecule and it will remain protonated, okay? Okay. So ask this question actually, this exact question without any changes in lecture one, but that was before we mentioned pKa's and this was just, um, this is before I really got into PKs and talking about this now, I want you guys to answer it, okay? Um, all right, and Tim should be able to open up the poll so you guys can get that in, okay. Um, is the poll open? Oh, yep, okay. Take a minute or two to do this, remember, um, the pH is five and uh, remember the general rule I gave you guys. So think what is more acidic, the environment or the molecule? And each of these points has a pKa value. So think will it be protonated, deprotonated?
Okay, maybe another 20 seconds. Okay, Tim, if you want to share the results. Yeah, so 50% said C, 20% said D, and 30% said B. I'm sorry, what did you say 20% said? Yeah, uh, D. D, okay. Um, okay, so the correct answer is actually B, uh, so 30% uh, got right. Um, so the reason um, some of you may have put uh, C is because you saw positive, negative, cancels out, positive, negative, cancels out, neutral charge, right? Well, this isn't the exact charge and they on the MCAT, well, they will not always give you exactly what form the molecules will be in, especially for S and base questions. So if you notice the pH was five, this has a pK of 6.04, right? Um, and you know nitrogen is usually a base. It's not uh, an acid, nitrogen containing compounds. So this is the deprotonated form, right? When it's pH 5, it'll actually become even more, um, so at pH 5, um, the environment is um, more acidic than the um, molecules, so it'll actually get another, um, so it'll actually become positive here, right? Right, so pay attention to this. Yeah. Okay, but these, however, were all right, see? So 10 greater than um, the environment, so it's protonated here. Um, this is deprotonated because it's less. Normally it would be an H, but it's deprotonated because the pK is less than the pH. So this is more acidic than the environment. Again, the environment is more acidic than this, so the N becomes protonated. Instead of NH2, it's NH3. And this as well, uh, more acidic than the environment. So what was once OH is now just O minus, okay? But this also gets protonated right at this location. And this is, um, if you want to talk about amino acids, this is um, these two ones are histidine. Okay. Uh, Mark, you were breaking up when you posted the rule. Uh, that, so the rule was that if it's in a more acidic environment, where it becomes protonated. So here, let me go back. Okay. Here. Yeah, let me screenshot that. Just leave that up. Okay. I got the rule. And let me just. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And if, if you want, I can explain the rule so you don't have to, you don't have yeah, to memorize if, it. Yeah, you yeah if you could it. explain it, because it, you were, I had to transition to my phone because my computer was, yeah. If you could explain it for me, please. Sure, no problem. Um, so as I mentioned, the pH is the measure of acidity, right? Maybe you can think of it that way. The higher it is, the less acidic it is. And the lower it is, the more acidic it is. pKa is also the measure of acidity of the compound. So if pH is greater than, uh, if the pH of the solution is greater than the pKa of the molecule, that means the environment is less acidic than the molecule. If it's less acidic than the molecule, the mo molecule will act as a, an acid and donate a proton. Therefore, it itself becomes deprotonated because it gives it away, okay? If the pH of the solution is less than the pKa, that means the solution is more acidic than the environment. Uh, the environment is more acidic than the, the molecule. If the environment is more acidic, the environment will give an H to, um, the molecule or the molecule will not give up its H and it will remain protonated because it didn't give it up. It's so like in this case, the NH3, the NH3 uh, pluses are protonated because um, they received an H, they were originally NH2, but they received uh, a proton from the environment because their pKa was higher. Same thing with these two histidines. The pKa is higher than the pH, therefore at this end, here, if I can annotate. So at this location, they'll actually receive an extra proton, an extra H, right? And they'll actually become NH pluses, right? 
and they'll become positive because they received an extra proton each. Whereas these what, two- What happened to the H on the second, um, you know, in the phenyl ring, right above that PKA equals 6.04? The, the, this, this one um, doesn't yeah. get touched. What happened? It doesn't get touched, okay. This one doesn't get touched. This is, this is the acidic, uh, this is the basic part, or the acidic basic part. This is okay, where the side formation. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, any you. other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So now we move on to what I consider the one of the hardest parts of acids and bases, titration. Okay. So what is titration? Let's just go over it in a lab procedure. Titration, and I'm sure some of you have done this either in gen, gen chem lab or maybe in high school chemistry or in organic chemistry labs. Titration is a slow addition of an acid to a base or an acid or a base to an acid. Usually we'll talk about addition of a base to an acid, but it could really go either way, okay? It's very gradual, meaning you literally add a couple of drops of, so on, under the assumption we add, um, we take a pool of acid and we're at slowly adding base to it. Um, you add literally a couple of drops of base at a time. You then measure the new pH of the solution. Then you add in a couple more drops of base, measure the pH again, and then repeat this many, many times until you have a, a large table with data points of amount of base you added in, in milliliters or however much it is, and then the pH of the solution. So as you add more, um, as you add more base, you expect the pH to also increase proportionally, right? because it will neutralize the acid and make it go up, okay? This is what a titration curve looks like because then once you have the data points, you can plot it. Likely what, what happened is, and I'll annotate, so just to get it clear to, um, here is li likely a data point here, maybe here, here, here. Like the, these red lines are all like data points. These are points where they added in a couple of drops of um, NaOH and then they uh, measured the pH at these points, right? So every, you see every couple of milliliters, you would add in more, right? So every couple of milliliters, you would add in a little more and then you'd see what the new pH is. Um, one thing you may notice um, is this big spike, okay? This is one of the most important points in the saturation curve. And in the middle of this large horizontal spike, you'll see this called the equivalence point. It's exactly in the center of this large graph or approximately in the center. And this value represents the point at which all of the base and all of the acid has neutralized each other. And essentially what you have is um, pretty much solely salt water in the case of strong acid and strong base. Um, at this point, like in terms of moles, all of the acid and base has kind of mixed and it's become like, um, like if you want to think about HCl plus NaOH, they split apart each, and then you just have HOH, which is just water, and NaCl mixing, which is salt. So you just have some salt and water, okay? Um, if we're talking about um, a strong acid and a strong base, like in the case of NaOH and HCl, which are both uh, strong acids and strong bases, um, the equivalence point is exactly uh, pH seven, so the point at which the equivalence point will happen on the y-axis, you can see is pH, it'll be, it'll be at exactly seven like it is in this case, because we're using NaOH and HCl. Um, however, um, if you want to use instead a weak acid and a strong base or vice versa, um, it's much more complicated. So it involves a lot of math, which likely will not be asked on the MCAT just because it involves calculators and it also takes a long time to do it. And for one problem, it's too much, but I will go over parts which may be involved in the MCAT. Likely the most you'll see in for equivalence point pHs is one, if they ask you strong acid and strong base, like in this case, NaOH and HCl, you have to know that it's seven um, at pH seven. Or if they give you an, a graph where the titration curve of maybe a strong acid and a weak uh, base or vice versa, the, you'll, and they'll give you the y-axis, then and they'll ask you for the pH at the equivalence point. You'll just have to see where halfway point is for this big spike. And that'll always be the equivalence point. And then just 
like match it to the pH. Okay, and I'll give you an example of this later. First, I want to um, and actually I'll ask that right now. So, at about what pH is the equivalence point of this titration curve? And if you want to start the poll. Okay, maybe another 20 seconds, get your answers in. Okay, um, do you want to share the results of the poll, um, Tim? Yeah, so 81% said D and 19% said C. And I'm sharing them. Okay, cool. Oh, um, most of you were right. It is um, it is D. Um, and uh, like like I mentioned, look at the equivalence. Uh, look at the big drop, and then just correlate the halfway point to whatever pH it is. So in this case, it was six. Like I mentioned, they like for th this one where you are guesstimating a little bit. So. Um, they won't give you anything that's too close. They won't give you like six or like me, they won't, might not even give you like seven or something. They'll give you something that, that's like very different like this. So you would have a like good estimate, right? Um, the reason it's not um, one is because this is at the bottom. So this is the pH after like it's been fully titrated, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions about like titration or anything so far? Yeah, that curve, is that of a, uh, what would that look like? It starts at a high pH. So should I assume that's the curve of a, a, a strong base? Um, yeah, it, it's of a, it, it's not necessarily of a base, but it, yeah, it, it's a base um, which is being titrated with a acid. Because the, the way you know if it's an acid or a base initially, uh, acids start low and go high, bases mm -hmm. start high and go low. So it's just of a base, not necessarily a strong. Okay, base against acid. Um, okay. Yeah. Base yeah. against acid. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, like I mentioned, there are some formulas I want you to know, and we've actually covered a couple of these. So, let's go over them. Uh, one at a time. So this one is actually the one that was mentioned before, pH plus pOH is equal to 14 always. Um, and as you can see here, pH is just the negative log of the concentration of H plus and pOH is just the negative log concentration of OH minus. This is for um, Arrhenius, if we're looking at Arrhenius uh, definition, okay? Mainly, um, and that's when the pOH is used, okay? And, um, so like I mentioned, so like say, they give you the concentration of H plus is equal to um, 10 to the negative fourth, something like that. Um, 
you and they ask you to find the pH, pH would be negative log of that. So negative log tends to negative fourth. Um, if you were just to do log of tends to the negative fourth, it would be negative four because it would just be the exponent. And then if you negate it to this negative sign, it would just be four. So the pH is equal to four. And as a note, if, if you ever mess up in your calculations, you can't have a negative um, pH value. pH is always positive. Okay. All right. What's in the exponent mark? Uh, negative log of what is that? It's, oh, it's negative spreading. four. It's negative four, okay. just this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go over the other ones. So um, this is another measure that they will often give you is Ka. Okay. Um, so pK and pKB or K A and KB. So they may ask you to translate between these two. So um, again, it's the same thing as the pH and the H plus. Uh, pK e equals negative log K. Again, if K is 10 to the negative sixth, um, log of that is negative six. Negate that is six, pK of six. Okay. Um, and then you have this uh, Kw. This is the um, ionic constant of water, okay? And it's always 10 to the negative 14th, okay? And it's just Ka times Kb, multiply them, okay? And, you'll, and you should always get 10 to the negative 14th. And so if you are given, say, if you're given the pKa, you can technically find um, the Ka, and then from the Ka, you can find the Kb. So you can go from pKa to Kb, something like that. They may ask you to do that. You just um, reverse this. So if you're given a Ka of uh, six, pK of six, they ask you to find uh, Kb. You would do, okay, well, I know the Ka is 10 to the negative sixth, right? Because it would just be log. Um, so if you undo the log, it'll be 10 to the negative this. So it'd be 10 to the negative sixth. And then you would just uh, divide 10 to the negative 14th over 10 to the negative sixth. And then you would get a Kb, okay? Yes, um, I do have a question. So what if they give you the pH? How do you transform that from pH to like pKa? Or is that possible? Uh, pH to pKa. Um, so pH and pKa, the way you would um, correlate those two is actually, because like I mentioned before, pH and pKa are actually of two different things. You can't really convert exactly. So pKa refers to a molecule. pH refers to the solution. Those are different. The way you would... Do that. The only way they could do that is actually uh, an equation we already covered. Henderson Hasselbeck. See, you do pH equals uh, pK plus log conjugate base with con uh, concentration of weak acid. That's how you do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And th this would be so, like, an example would be if they said we're adding uh, con this much concentration of this weak acid, because this is mostly for weak acids, we're adding this much concentration of weak acid. Uh, with that has this pKa into a solution of water. What is the pH of the solution? You would have concentration, um, which you would have to find acid and base, and then pKa, and then you would just find pH. Okay. Um, back to this. Oops. Okay. Uh, yeah, like I'll mention she's also tutor. Um, and last. Uh, equations I want to mention, and th these are, I think, the least common, but also like maybe the hardest to memorize. This one, the Ka, and the Kb is just you to remember it's the opposite. But so Ka is just the concentration of H plus times the concentration of the conjugate base over the concentration of conjugate acid. Okay. And um, this actually equation is how the Henderson Hasselbalch equation is derived, like initially. That, that's how they derived it, right? They use these equations, use these equations like a combination of these, a couple of these equations, mainly this one, okay? This is if you're trying to find PK, uh, Ka, and you don't, um, this is if you're trying to really find Ka, you can use the Henderson, Henderson Hasselbalch equation and it actually works as well, but it just involves maybe a little more conversion depending on what they ask for, PK or KB or Ka, okay? Any other questions about any of these equations? Okay. So 
So let's see. Actually, um, sorry, I have a question. Sure. What's what's the difference between KA and PKA? So um, ma like math mathematically, it's just um, KA is more like um, K. Firstly, um, the, the form is different. Like ma mathematically, just I'm, I'm telling you, um, K will always be in the form um, something. So let's say like a number, let's say like six times 10 to the negative, and then it'll be a number here, maybe like five or 10 or negative to the negative 10th or like um, whatever, right? PKA is always a number like 6.3 or 11.2, right? Um, that, that's like for, uh, in form how they look different. Um, K, uh, and then you, it's because of how they're derived. So K, PKA is just the negative log of KA. So if you had six and 10 to the negative fifth as a KA, the PKA would be like 5.5, 5, something like that, right? So you can see like how they are like this. Um, as for, in terms of like the actual chemistry of what they are and like what like they represent, those, that's a lot more complicated. That's something that not, you don't really have to know um, because they always give you the actual values. Like, and going into it is really unrelated and it's like more like something you would cover in like a general chemistry course where you really have like days and lectures and lectures to talk about specifically this. So I don't wanna get into it too much here, okay? No, that's perfect. Thank you, that was super helpful. Um, is it true that strong as we only have uh, K and ever, uh, what's a BK, um, Opal? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, what did I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I wrote the question correctly. Yeah, mm. I was told strong acids only have PKA, never PK, uh, never a KB. Oh, KB. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, what did I put? Uh, what did yeah, I you, type? Okay, you, you just wrote uh, BK, but it's, it's fine, I got it. Okay, okay. so that, mm -hmm. I, I want to mention this. Um, KA and KB are in a way, ex like exclusive, but everything has both a KA value and a KB value. They just might be radically different, right? KA represents the strength of, of the molecule as an acid. So if you have a K, uh, let's, let's talk about PKA because that's easier to just understand. Um, if you have a PKA of two, it means it's a pretty strong acid. If you have a PKA of 50, um, that's a very, very, very weak acid, okay? But it doesn't necessarily tell you how good of a base it is either. Keep in mind, because something like I mentioned, like a meth methyl group has like a PK of like 70. So you, it's a very weak base, but it's not actually a good, it's not a very, it's a very weak acid, but it's not a very good base either, actually, if you, if you were looking at it that way, right? So they're not exactly mutually exclusive, okay? Okay. Um, PKB is, is the opposite. It's the measure of how strong something is as a base. Some like um, that has a PKB of three is a strong mm -hmm. base. Some that has a PKB of 50, very weak base. Again, mm -hmm. again, doesn't necessarily mean it's a strong acid though. Doesn't mean it's even an acid at all. It just means it's a weak base. Okay. So it's all relative kind of almost. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and someone else had a question. If pH and pH are very close, the same, then will the amino acid be? Um, so, if the pH and pH are uh, very close, it would actually mean, and we're going to cover this. It would mean it's in, um, it exists in both forms. So we're, we'll cover. The, and actually, I mentioned it very briefly before. Um, here, I believe. So when the pH and the pK are equal, it exists in both forms at an equal amount. So like for example, back to here, um, if the pK of, of this acid is like 4.5 at, at pH four or five, it would exist in this form equally as much as it would exist in this form. It would exist in both forms in the same amount, okay? Even when the, the pH and the pK are um, different, they, it does usually exist in both forms, just much more of one form than the other. But just like in equilibrium, it always exists in multiple forms. Okay. Yeah. 
And we'll actually um, cover that a little bit more in a couple of minutes, okay? Okay, but first I wanna get um, this question. Okay, this one's a little bit harder. Um, really think about it. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, not sure. Uh, has the poll been started? Uh, yeah, sorry. I was a little late on that. It's up. Okay, uh, another 30 seconds to get transfers in. Okay, um, feel free to show the poll when we're ready. All right, so 13% said A. 47% said B, 27% said C, and 13% said D. Uh -huh. The correct answer is B. So um, with this, um, I would suggest um, first, you know, that the K is exactly one. From this, I would convert, um, since at least for me, and I'm sure some of you, I'm not as comfortable with K um, for measuring acidity rather than um, pK. So I would um, switch to pK first. Um, what that uh, would do is one, if you do negative log of that, you get something that's actually like a negative pK. So what that tells me is it's a strong acid. Um, so that, what that tells me is a pretty strong acid, just like I mentioned with. Um, so the HCl was negative six pH, pK. And so if you add it to a concentration to a solution, it would be acidic to some degree, which would be less than seven, okay? All right. Uh, any questions? Uh, I so had a question. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, no, you first, go ahead. Okay, um, so if it's less than one it would it be a weak acid so um are you referring to k or pk k a k a if it's less than one uh if it it's less than uh one so it, it's not ne it's not negative it won't it will k is not cannot be negative k can be very small it can be like 10 to the negative three which is different than it's not a negative number it's like one it's like actually point zero zero one if, if that makes sense. So a K can be like 0 0.001, 0 0.00000001, okay? Okay. okay. Um, and what that means, if it's less than one, what that means is um, the, P, the PKA is positive. If the PKA is um, positive, that means, um, that means 
it's not, not necessarily a weak acid, it's weaker acid. But I believe that like a pK of like one or two is still, I guess, considered a strong acid, I'd say. But I'm not exactly sure on where the cutoff is, but um, yeah, no, yeah, it, it, it's still like a strongish acid. The like, growth, like you, most of the stuff you have to think relatively, even if the pK was like one or two, it would still be pretty strong acid. I would still put B as the answer, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know you solved this one conceptually, but if you were to use one of the formulas you said to start with the pH equal the negative log of H. So if the negative log of one, you said you'll have a negative pH, but there's no such thing. So like, which formula would I use to solve this one? So you don't you don't know what the concentration of H is because you don't they're not it's an unknown concentration. It says it in the um, prompt. Well, if if you were to use it uh, mathematically, and I kind of did so it could be converting Ka to pKa first, like this, right? Uh, log of one is zero. So actually I think pKa is um, zero, which is also a strong acid. Um, and it would still be less than one. It'd just be you're adding a strong acid, yeah. Okay. So do I ignore the negative sign? You said the log of one, shouldn't it be the negative log of one? Um, yeah, but negative zero, zero. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, makes no, sense. Yeah, oh, yeah. got it now. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, now we want to talk about uh, multiprotic acids. So they're acids that are diprotic or triprotic. This means that they can be deprotonated twice or possibly even three times. Um, so for example, HCl deprotonates into H plus and Cl minus, and then that's it, you can't do it anymore. You can't deprotonate anymore. It's already in its most basic form. Therefore, it's only monoprotic. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4, can deprotonate once into HSO4 minus, but HSO4 minus can also be deprotonated again into SO4 two minus. So it's a diprotic acid because it can be deprotonated once and then twice. Phosphoric acid can turn into H2PO4, then HPO4, and finally into PO4. It can be deprotonated three times, so it's triprotic, okay? And this is what a titration curve would look like of a diprotic acid. And so you see it, it looks like exactly like a titration curve of a monoprotic acid up until this point, in which case it, it's, it repeats, it makes another curve, right? And this is because, for, I, here, I might be easier with annotations. So right now it's H2SO4 at the start. Then about here, it's HSO4 at this point. And then finally at about this point, it's just SO4, right? So this represents the first deprotonation event and this represents the second deprotonation event, okay? Um, I also want to talk, and again, each of them have their own equivalence point, right? So it has here and here, again, to where the um, spike is, halfway point, okay? And I want to mention this midpoint, which is also important, okay? Um, so if you see this midpoint, it's very like, flat in this direction, like if this way, it, it's the most, this is the area where it's like most flat in this midpoint. It's also in the middle of this flat area, right? Okay. And what this means is that exactly halfway, exactly half of the um, acid has been converted into conjugate base. So at this point, at this midpoint one, half of the H2SO4 has been converted to HSO4. So there, at this point, there's an equal amount of H2SO4 and HSO4, right? So half, it, half of the total amount has been deprotonated. This may um, seem familiar because this is the exact definition of pKa, right? So at this point, the pH at the midpoint is actually equal to the pKa of this initial acid, okay? So say this initial acid had a pKa of four. Well, this P, uh, pKa of four, this would correspond to um, four, 
So let me clear this drawing. So at this, it will be pH of four because the acid had a pKa of four, okay? Um, and then again, at this point, most of the, pretty much all of the um, initial acid has been converted to the base uh, into HSO4. And then at this point, half of the HSO4 has been converted to just SO4, okay? Um, and this would have its own, HSO4 has its own pKa value, which corresponds to this midpoint too. So let's say eight. Okay, does that make sense? So, I'm sorry. Could you label back what's midpoint one, what's the concentrations are, what the concentrations are? Okay, um, sure. So again, initially you had H2SO4, and then um, at this point you have HSO4, that's what it's being converted into. At this point, the concentration of this is equal to the concentration of this. So it's halfway to being deprotonated, Full, like fully all of it being deprotonated. So right. So half of the, of the total H H2SO4 so that you had at the beginning has been converted, but the other half stays the same. It hasn't been converted yet, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the, the amounts of the converted and the non-converted are equal at this midpoint, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is very important. And again, um, this is something you would calculate. Um, first, you it's equal to the pKa, the pH equals to the pKa. And you can also look at a graph. So it's halfway in between the, the start and the equivalence point. So again, here, halfway between this start and this equivalence point is the midpoint. And it corresponds to a pH value. So you can get it from a graph. They may ask you, what is the pKa of um, H2SO4, for example? And, if, and looking at this graph, what is the pKa of H2SO4? And you have to look for the midpoint, find the pH it corresponds to, and that's, that's what it is, so four in this case, okay? Um, and this actually has a pretty important application in experiments and in um, biology in general. I, that's okay, Carl. That was exactly what I was getting to. Um, actually, oh, for, first, um, I wanted to do this, but I will be getting into the buffer zone in a minute after this question. Do you want to put up the poll? Okay, take another 30 seconds. Um, Tim, if you want to share the results. Yeah, sure. I just realized that um, the polls only go up to um, D, A, B, C, D. So, oh, yeah. Well, spoiler, um, spoiler alert, E was not the answer. Anyway. 
<laughs> um, okay, so 23% said A, 23% said B, 15% said C, and then 38% for D. Hmm. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, so the correct answer is actually C, which had the least amount of votes. So I'm going to take my time going over this. So why can you eliminate A, right? Well, you know that it's um, the base that's being used to titrate is a strong base. And you know that HCl is a strong acid. So what did I mention about strong acids and strong bases? Well, the equivalence point is always equal to, um, the equivalence point is always equal to seven in those cases, right? Well, if you look here, the equivalence point, this bump halfway, it's about eight-ish, nine-ish. It's not seven. Because of that, you know that um, the answer can be a strong acid. So therefore, A is out it, because it's a strong acid. Similarly, B is also out. B is actually also a strong acid. But even simpler, simpler, you can actually eliminate B because if you see, this is only has one bump. It's actually a monoprotic acid. If it was H2SO4, which is a diprotic acid, it would, look, it would have two curves, two bumps, like I showed before. So it can't be H2SO4 either. This leaves, leaves C, D, and I, E, if you um, were considering the initial question. Um, between these, how would you differentiate? Well, they're all weak acids. Um, as I mentioned, HF is weak acid, um, and these are all weak acids as well. Um, so which of these could, they, could it be? Because they're all weak and monoprotic. Well, you have to look at the Ka value. Like I mentioned, the midpoint is the the midpoint is equal to the Ka value. Well, it goes from here to he from here to here about. So the midpoint should be about maybe here-ish, let's say here. What does this correspond to? This corresponds to a pK of five. So which of these has a pK of five? Well, you know the Ka, negative log. This is five, so this would have a pK of 5.1 or something. Uh, this would have 4.5, 4.6-ish, and this would have 10.5-ish, right? Well, which of these is closest to five? This one, so this is the answer. That's why you can eliminate, eliminate D and E. And does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Is everybody clear on why like the answers they chose were wrong? So the flat part is the what now? Is it this? I was looking more at the steeper part. The flat part is the equivalence point or the steep part? Which so part is the equivalence point is here. Right. That's what I was thinking. Uh-huh. But you're looking yeah. at the mm -hmm. this is the midpoint. Equivalence point and midpoint are different. Oh, that's you see, I was getting confused. So equi was, equivalence point is the halfway point of the of this, the steep part. The midpoint mm -hmm. is the halfway point between is it's the flat part, the halfway through the flat part, and it's the midpoint, and it's in the middle. That's why it's called the midpoint of the starting and of this steep part. So it would be mm -hmm. like, yeah, so it would be in the middle of here, which is like this in the flat part. So why did you use the midpoint and not the equivalence point to determine that the pH was five? Mm -hmm. So the equivalence point can only, like I mentioned, it can be used to determine um, what kind of K and uh, whatever we would need. But if you were to do that for each of these uh, K values, you would get, um, it would take you at least 15 minutes for this question and you would not do well on the exam. The easiest way to do it for, the easiest way to do it is you have a strong acid and a strong base, you know it's always seven. So you can eliminate A and B because it's not seven, it's higher than seven, right? Whereas- And we knew it's higher, why? Why did we, how, we, how did we know it was higher? Oh, because um, if you look at the midpoint of this oh, curve- Oh, okay. it's, less, it, it's, it's less, less. above, yeah, it's above seven. So yes, seven, it is. seven would be here, yeah, okay. So it's, not, so it's not a strong acid being mixed with a strong base, so it's not A or B. 
it's, it has to be a weak acid. So these three are left. Um, midpoint is easy because you, if you know the pKa and you know what the value, the pH of the midpoint is, it's very easy. You just line it up. So you know the value of the midpoint was five. So which of these has a pKa of five? This one has 4.5, this one has 5.1, this one has 10. This one, 4.5 4 might be a little bit tempting, but if you look at it, like 4.5 will be like right here. And it's like where it initially started. So that's why you could eliminate that, right? So it started above four. So it already, not by the midpoint, it would be well above that. It would be at the five range. Okay. So just one, one more last thing. Um, mm -hmm. You said the pH, we're looking at the, the steeper part of the graph, not the flat part. So de depending on what you're looking for, if you're looking for equivalence point, you look at this steep part, the pH mm -hmm. at this steep part, the midpoint mm -hmm. of this steep part. But for this, question, mm -hmm. for, for this question. For this question I used, I looked at both. So I looked to eliminate A and B, I looked at the equivalence point, which is here, uh -huh. and then and matched it to the pH. And then for the, once I eliminated A and B, then I looked at the midpoint, which is okay. here, and okay. then I matched it to here. Okay, so use then, both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody? Yes, no, yes, it makes sense now. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a question. So the midpoint is for weak acids, if you're looking for weak acids. Yeah, yes, because with a strong acid, you actually can't really use um, the midpoint thing. That's only for weak acids. That, that, oh, that's okay. right. Yeah. Because yeah. With, a with a strong acid, the pK is like negative four, negative six you can't have a negative pH, like the midpoint can never be negative, so you can't really use it. So a strong acid you would identify if the equivalence point is at seven, oh. when it's mixing with a strong base. Yeah. The, the, that, this mid, this mid, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I would like to move on to, like I mentioned, this is um, the application of this idea. So buffers, I'm sure if you've taken bio lab or even chemistry lab, you've used buffers before, buffer solutions. So a buffer is a compound used in many experiments in order to maintain the pH of the experimental solution at a certain level. So in other words, the purpose of a buffer is to resist any changes in pH that may occur during the experiment. During the experiment, you may make a little bit of acid, a little bit of base as like a byproduct, and that would change the pH, which would alter your experiment. You wanna keep it constant, the pH. So you would have a buffer to prevent those changes, to kind of like halt them, okay? Um, the most common buffers are actually weak acids and bases, which um, may seem kind of strange. But the reason they do this is because when the target pH of the experiment is near the pK of the, acid, the weak acid you're using, it is not easy to change the pH. So again, looking at, um, even like this graph, because it's clear. So if we wanted to do um, an experiment at slightly than higher uh, human conditions at pH eight, we could use this as a buffer, this solution HSO4, if we send this to HSO4, because at pH eight, it's in its midpoint, it's what its pKa is at, and it's at its midpoint. If you add in a little bit strong, a little bit of base, it would go here. If you um, make it a little more acidic, it'll go here. If you notice, both of these on the y-axis haven't really changed. Like they're still on, the pH is still the same. Whereas if you look at like somewhere here, if you go a little bit to the right, well, it's a completely different pH now. If you go a little bit to the left, completely different pH now, right? The pHs are very different. So it wouldn't resist changes at this range very well. But at this range, if you move a little bit left or a little bit right, it's still pretty much the same pH essentially. So it will prevent the pH from changing at all. Yeah, the buffer zone is always the flat zone. The buffer zone is always like um, right where the midpoint is. So, and right where the pKa is of the acid or the buffer. So if you're using a weak acid as a buffer, the buffer zone is right around where its pH, uh, pKa is. So it'd be like, maybe like this boxed area, right? be right around the midpoint. And it's always like the flat area on the curve. Okay, does that make sense? Can you guys see why like if you, from the midpoint, if you moved a little bit left or right, the pH wouldn't change? 
um, the, the, this would make the, the worst buffer. This would actually make like the worst buffer because if you moved a little bit to the right, like even like this much to the right, you changed pH by like two. Like it's very, very different. Or move a little to the left, you've again changed the pH by two. It's very, if there's even a little change in the concentration of acid or base, like the, it's gonna go like the pH kind of fluctuate very heavily. Um, does that have a name? Um, I'm not sure if it has a name, but I know this is called the equivalence point, but I'm not sure if this area has a name exactly. Um, it's something you might want to look uh, like Google, I guess, look, look it up. But I, I know this is where the equivalence point is. Uh, so Mark, I know you said mm -hmm. we could just um, draw a vertical line to figure out the pH from the, uh, mm -hmm. from yeah, back to the, um, that mm -hmm. axis, the X axis. Mm -hmm. um, now, would they ever tell us to calculate the pH? I mean, I'd, certainly we could just look at it and draw the line, but you, you said that was the definition of pK when you use that uh, H2SO4, you said it could mm -hmm. be converted to HSO4, mm -hmm. which is the half the total amount is deprotonated mm -hmm. and that's the definition of pKa. So what, the, what um, equation would we say pH equal pKa1 plus pKa2 divided by two or? or um i'm not sure you mean so if we're looking okay. at h2so4 it has mul multiple protonation events and actually multiple pka so it has a pka1 a pka2 oh. yes right? that's what so, I'm so the pka1 would be um this mm -hmm. the pka2 would be this it right. wouldn't have like an average pka it would have a pka1 and a pka2 because and a triprotic uh -huh. would have a pka1 pka2 and pka3 three uh-huh oh, yeah. okay one, two, nice. three. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so again, buffer is very important. You probably use them in experiments. They're used very commonly. Um, so if you were to ask a question, like for example, which of these um, which of these compounds would make the best buffer at pH eight? It would be the one that has the pKa closest to eight, or about about eight, right? And that would be the best buffer at that pH. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Any any questions before I move on to the last part? Okay. Um, okay. So next, I want to talk about um, color change tests. This um, is a way we can measure um, the pH without using a pH meter or something like more specific or exact to visualize. Um, you could say. So one common way is to use a litmus test. A litmus test is um, involves taking um, part of a special paper called litmus paper into, a sol into the solution you're looking at and seeing if it changes color. So a litmus paper normally is um, one color. So like say blue, so there's a blue litmus paper. If it comes into contact with a solution of a certain pH, it'll instantly like change color um, in that area where it had contact. So if you had um, a piece of paper, here, let me show you. if you had like this piece of paper and this came into contact with the, the pH of the solution, this only this part would change color and you could see it, right? So a blue litmus paper may change red when it comes in contact with an acidic solution. If it comes into contact with a neutral solution or a basic solution, it would just become wet and it wouldn't change color, it would stay blue, okay? And you could tell whether something's acidic or basic. You can't get exact pHs, but you can guess like rough ballparks, like is it acidic or basic, okay? Um, a more exact way is um, using another color changing test um, using an indicator chemical, okay? So indicator chemicals are usually liquids um, and they're usually, uh, you take a couple of drops of the indicator and you um, using a, a dropper, you just drop them into the solution. Um, so for example, uh, bromothamyl blue, it's normally blue, like in its base form, in like its normal packaging. Um, if you drop it into a solution of that's greater than pH uh, seven, the whole solution will turn blue because it's being like, it's like a dye. Um, if it's between pH six and seven, it'll actually turn green instead of blue. And if it's below pH six, the whole solution will actually turn yellow instead of blue or green, right? And of course, this, this has um, shades 
So if you do um, a pH of six, it'll turn straight yellow. 6.5 may turn yellow greenish. Um, seven, it'll turn like more green. 7.5 green blue, seven clear blue. Okay, does that make sense? Um, no, I, you, you don't really have to know the mechanism behind the color change. Um, because it, it's a lot, it's a lot more complicated, involves a lot of um, optics as well as um, e each indicator is also different. So bromothymol blue, generally it, it involves like um, structural changes um, and kind of um, double bonding resonance structures, things like that. Um, but you, each one has different and you don't really have to know that, right? Um, so one thing they may give you is an effective range for the indicator. So like, for example, the range of bromothymol blue is pH 5 to pH 7.5 about. Um, so this doesn't mean that if you drop it into a pH other than this, it won't work. Um, if you drop it into pH of solution, say three, it'll still turn it uh, yellow, right? And if you drop it into pH 11, it'll still turn blue. What this effective range means is that anything uh, pH five or below will be the exact same shade of yellow regardless of, of the pH. And all the pHs greater than 7.5 will have the same shade of blue, right? So you wouldn't be able to tell a solution, if you dropped it into two solutions, one pH eight, one pH 11, you wouldn't be able to tell how, if one is more acidic or basic than the other, because they'll look the same in terms of color. Um, but if, but within the, the the effective range, you would be able to because it would show um, different shades or mixtures, right? So like, um, for example, pH 6.5 and 7.5 will have different shades of blue-green, right? And you'll be able to tell like, this is 6.5, this is 7.5, right? And you'll be able to differentiate the two different solutions based on the color the solution turns the shade, okay? And within that range, the shade varies from, and it depends on, of course, the the indicator you use, some of them are brown to yellow, others are blue to green, whatever. Okay. Any questions about any of this? Um, yeah, so um, the, if we want to look at it from an optics point of view, um, the, they, they absorb, um, chem, the chemical compounds, they absorb certain wavelengths of light. And so if they absorb certain wavelengths, they um, they reflect other ones and that's the color that you see. So for example, um, if you drop it into a basic, so bromothymol blue, if you drop it into basic like pH seven, um, it'll absorb um, certain colors and it'll reflect blue, like mostly it won't absorb blue, it'll reflect, reflect it. And so that's why it appears blue. Whereas if you dropped it into an acidic solution, the conformate, the actual structure of the molecule, the bonding and stuff will, will change. And instead of absorbing everything except blue, it'll absorb everything except yellow and it'll reflect yellow back to you. So based on the structural changes, it'll absorb and reflect different colors, different wavelengths of light. Yeah, and, that, and that's what happens. And um, that's based on like the bonding, like I mentioned, and the interaction with the solution. Is, is your bromomethyl blue the standard for which the other indicators are measured? So everything is based on bromomethyl blue? Um, no, bromothymol blue is just an ex example of one indicator that's very commonly used okay. because, because its effective range is like around like neutral, right? So that's why it's very commonly used, especially in like biology, where most experiments are done at like around neutral pH, right? So like uh, other indicators are used for more extremes, like maybe some work between pHs three and five, others between like nine and 11. They're using different pH ranges, effective range. Um, it's just this one's very common because of biology. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I believe, yeah, okay. So that, that was it for the lecture. Um, if you have any questions about anything I talked about today, feel free to ask. Um, as a reminder, office hours are every Saturday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have any questions about this or any topics, um, again, we'll try and get the PowerPoint recording out to you. We'll post them in the group me, which I will post actually right now in the um, chat. Um, if you don't uh, find them or so, you can maybe email me, but they'll, 
be in the group me. Um, the YouTube is already being recorded right now through live and will be posted. Um, the PowerPoint recordings I'll just put into the Google Drive and I'll um, reshare the, and I'll repost them into the Google Drive or the Google folder. Yeah, uh, Mark, when I tried to join the Google thing, when I clicked on the link, you sent me, keep asking me for a password or, I, I mean, I don't. It shouldn't have a password. If I will also post it, I'll, I'll keep them all in a Google um, Drive folder, um, but I'll also post them like individually as files, okay? I'll also post PowerPoint as a file and also put it in the Google Drive folder. Therefore, if you um, want to find it as a file, you'll be able to. If you want to join the Google Drive, you should be able to. Not sure what the problem is. Um, I'll try sharing it again. Everybody should have access to it um, with the link. So not sure. You you'll have to just yeah. Okay. And Tim Tim posted the group me. Yeah. Um, if that's it, any other questions? Anything about any really anything? Not necessarily about the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. If no questions, you guys are uh, free to go. I'll stick around for another couple of minutes and then I'll um, end the meeting as well. Mark, mm -hmm. is yep. the midpoint also the half equivalence point? Because I've never really heard it as the midpoint of what as the half equivalence point. So yeah. are yeah. those like interchangeable? So, yeah. So the, the, that's what I mentioned too. Um, it's halfway between the, the start and the, and the half equivalence, and the equivalence point. So yeah. So depending on which bit, which uh, whichever, if it's a weak base or weak acid that's been titrated, it's just half of the weak base that's turned into conjugate acid and half of the weak, weak acid that's turned into conjugate base. Yeah, it, it depends what you initially had, not not what you're titrating with, what you're adding, but what you initially had. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and next week, for anybody who's still here, next week is um, Psych and Social. We're going to be talking about experimental design, I, I believe, and um, group interactions, like how people interact with other groups. And it will be um, Janelle who is uh, taking over um, next week rather than me. Um, until when? So uh, this is week uh, five. We're doing eight weeks. I believe that ends June 6th is the last one, June 14th, the week of, we're starting the 15 week program, yeah. Mark, do we need to uh, recognize characteristic graph where weak acid, strong base, dipodic, tripodic? Because there's some signature um, look for these graphs. For example, when one dips with the lip, it starts off with a lip. We know that's starting with not a strong, but a weak acid, do, should we? kind of memorize what those look like? Um, so for example, this you know, is diprotic because it has two events. If it has three events, like three of these like curves, that means it's um, triprotic. If it has only one, it's monoprotic. Um, like I mentioned, strong acid and uh, strong base interactions will always have um, equivalence point of seven. Um, otherwise it'll be weak acid. So that one would, I know it's tri diprotic, but the fact that it starts with that dip at number two, as opposed to, you know, it has that lip that, as opposed to something that's strong that would start higher. It would, should I just know this is a so, weak? So would for, I know just because um, it's? Mm -hmm. So for this one, I don't actually know because they didn't actually mention it. Um, if it's mm -hmm. a uh, strong acid or weak acid, um, the and with um, these, it's a little more uh, difficult, um, like the diprotic ones whether it's a strong or weak acid, um, but not, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by lip. In terms of where it starts the pH two, that could actually um, be more mm -hmm. confusing because it's not, if you add enough strong acid, uh, mm -hmm. if, you add, if you add very little strong acid, it'll start higher. Like if you start with very, very small amounts of HCl, very low concentration, it'll, it might start higher. Whereas if you add more concentration of the same acid, say like you had a lot of very concentrated HCl, it'll start lower. So you can't you can't determine based on where it starts, not usually. What the pH is, it depends on how concentrated the solution is. Okay, and this is my last question. It has um, it's not with this lecture mm -hmm. uh, on the MCAT as far as um, 
epimers like man, glucose, mannose, galactose, do we um, memorize structure or just kind of know? Because there's so many, you know, so, you know, we need to know that this one is the C2 epimer, this one. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to go about those? Uh, those? So um, I didn't memorize those like that. You do have mm -hmm. to know, like, I was like, um, at what, what an epimer is, you'd have to know, like, um, and you'd have to be able to like kind of figure out um, what like uh, glucose. By the way, you should you, de you definitely should know like the full structure of it, like the up and down. Um, but uh, other than that, I don't think most of them are really that important that you have them memorized. You can if you want to just be sure, because maybe they may, might ask you about it, but usually they don't. So I didn't really um, do it, but you could if you wanted to. Um, mainly you just have to know like wh what each carbon like means. So like, I remember, um, like the C2 carbon, uh, like how to name them. So like the C2 carbon might determine like alpha beta, something like that. Right. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and Tim mentioned the hand shapes, uh, with birth interview. I'm not sure. I didn't memorize the, the, all the sugar names actually. I'm, I memorized glucose and that's about it. The rest I just um, kind of didn't know exactly. Okay, um, any other questions from anybody? Uh, otherwise, I think it, I might be ending. Yeah, so yeah, so you you can if Berkeley Review has a good way to memorize it, you can uh, for everybody who's wondering. Um, Mark, I was wondering if you would upload the the slide of the other sessions, uh, the Google Docs on uh, GroupMe. So yeah, so th they've already been posted um, as files in the GroupMe as PowerPoint files, um, but they're also kept in a Google Drive folder um that that's always being updated so i'll upload this one as a powerpoint file to the group me and i'll also upload it to the google drive folder and then i'll um e uh, copy and paste the link of the google drive folder into the into the group me as well so you can have access to if you can open up the folder you'll have access to all of the previous powerpoints like right there to download okay awesome thank you so much no problem have right. a great week everyone all right, so have a great day. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I said bye, enjoy. Oh, okay. All right, so, um, yeah, so I'll see you guys um, next week. Wait, Mark, could I, I'm, I'm actually going to email yeah. you. I have a, a couple of questions. Is it okay if I email you? Um, if you... I, uh, I don't necessarily know what I have a question on right now. I just know that um, like it was a good review and then mm -hmm. I understand it. Um, but like, just like some clarifications on different, different, um, subjects, not, not necessarily acid base. So, um, if, if there's simple questions, um, that email yeah. will be fine. If it's more, um, in depth or more specific, um, like I mentioned office hours or Saturdays, yeah, um, Saturdays. Join, join, okay. join me for that. Yeah. Okay. It would be the same My way. exam is in two weeks. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. So if you, <laughs> if, if you email, I will um, mention that and I'll, I'll really, I'll try and do my best over email. If not, come, come to me on Saturday. Got it. Okay. okay. All, right. All right. So I'll email you. Thank you. Thank you guys mm -hmm. so much. Thank you. All right. Enjoy. All right. Bye. All right. All right. Bye guys. All right. Thank